Good evening. This is the December 14th, 1998 uh, meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. It's regular meeting number nine of the 98-99 year. We have a roll call by the town clerk. Chairman Groff. Here. Councilor Berry. Here. Councilor Carson. Here. Councilor Fritz. Here. Councilor McGinty. Here. Councilor Reed. Here. And Councilor Watson. Here. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, Madam Clerk, I see you also have one of our student representatives. It should be Matt Martin. Yes, we do, Matt Martin. Citizens discussion of items not on the agenda. <coughs> if you would state your name and your address, please. Yes, my name is Ellen Mugar and I live at 77 Wells Road. I'd like You, you want to take that microphone up a little bit. Oh, That's right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to present a petition addressing issues of concern at the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club on Sawyer Road. With this petition is a sampling of information with a guide which will give you some background to the issues presented. Though the petition has been around for a year, most of the signatures are from this past election day. We hope that the 300 plus signatures will encourage you to investigate, discuss, and take action in the form of an ordinance. The gun club is answerable to no one. We want that to change. The town must regulate this shooting range in a residential zone beside a public road. The comments from signers of the petition have ranged from, well, I think it should be discussed, to close the place down. Closing the club down is not our intent. We only want them to be good neighbors and to take responsibility for the contamination of their wetland, wetland site and to take responsibility for the dangers and extreme levels of noise inherent to their sport. For this, they need your help. We have also heard this petition is going to fall on deaf ears. And historically, our concerns have been met with just that. We are saying, please, the time has come to listen. The area has changed, and a grandfather clause does not prevent you from protecting our natural resources and the peace, health, and safety of our community. Thank you for your attention to this, and please call me with any questions. I wish each of you happy holidays. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. You, you could just hand them to the clerk. Are there any other uh, citizens who wish to discuss an item not on the agenda? Yes, we do have a presentation, don't we? Sandy Keenan, I believe. I'll meet you at the podium. Hello. Good. Come on, you get the thirds. Tonight, uh, Cape, we have a Cape Elizabeth Town Council resolution, Cape Elizabeth Garden Club 50th anniversary. Whereas the Cape Elizabeth Garden Club is celebrating its 50th anniversary in 1998, and is Cape Elizabeth's largest independent service organization, <clears throat> and whereas, through the good works of hundreds of its members over the years, the town has seen many areas beautified, including the Thomas Memorial Library, the Town Hall, Fort Williams Park, and Portland Headlight, and whereas the Garden Club has sponsored student scholarships, conducted educational horticultural programs for youth and adults, and has hosted seminars which have enriched local knowledge of good planting practices, and whereas the town of Cape Elizabeth has been the recipient of hundreds of wreaths and holiday decorations over the last 50 years as the result of the generosity of Garden Club members. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council in Town Council Assemble does hereby salute the Cape Elizabeth Garden Club on its 50th anniversary 
We thank its members for all they have done for our community, and we wish continued success to its leaders and members for decades to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a beautiful plaque. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Chairman Groff and Town Council, on behalf of the Cape Elizabeth Garden Club, it is my privilege to accept the resolution in recognition of the efforts of all the members, past and present, who have and are dedicated to beautifying, educating, preserving the natural beauty of this town. We are proud of the 50 years of experience to this community and look forward to continuing many years and many more projects enhancing this town through gardening. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. We have councillors' reports and correspondence. Is there any councillor with something to report? And none of you corresponded? I, uh, I did go to a meeting on behalf of Mr. McGovern uh, uh, this last week with, uh, about the tall ships coming in the summer of 2000. And it's a very exciting project. Uh, the communities of Cape Elizabeth, South Portland, and Portland are going to be involved. Portland is the only small city on the East Coast uh, that's going to participate in this. It is a huge deal. And we're at the ground floor right now, and uh, uh, obviously Fort Williams Park will uh, play a role, and the, the headlight plays a role in this celebration. And the idea now is to get things at an early stage before the appropriate committees, the advisory group, so we can start to plan. But on behalf of all of you, I certainly uh, expressed our enthusiasm for this uh, project. Now, are there any other counselors with any reports or correspondence? None. Uh, we're going to move then to the town manager's report. And since this is the end of the calendar year, I had asked the town manager uh, to try to recap for all of you at home and all of you that are here uh, what has happened in the town this year. I think it's a, a good exercise for all of us and uh, um, I know it's certainly indicative of all the, the good work our many town employees have done. So with that, Michael. We're doing this with a PowerPoint. So it might be easier if the counselor sat down here. I'm always for that. Council uh, Chairman Groff asked me to do a, a bit more of an overview of what occurred in Cape Elizabeth in the, in the year 1998. So I thought we'd, we'd experiment and do it in, in the form of a PowerPoint uh, uh, presentation. Uh, as this indicates, this particular year was very much a year of progress. And I think as you see some of the things that went on this year, I think the council members, uh, those who serve on committees, town employees, and all of the citizens uh, should really be proud of what they were able to do uh, by working together. What I've done is divided it into a number of areas of looking at different things that occurred. Uh, quite a bit of the progress that was made this year 
was in the area of improvements to our various facilities. Uh, I think one of the most important things, and I think as, as uh, Joe Groff mentioned at the time that it, it occurred, was that a real legacy of this year will be the purchase of the Levitt property, which the council's talked about coming up with a new name for the property, but it's that parcel of land, a little over 100 acres, that's next door to the refuse disposal area and where there are currently plans, and there'll be a master plan before the council next month that'll put public works facility there as well as ball fields and nature trails. Uh, also this year, a major expansion got underway of the Riverside Cemetery, which will help that facility to serve the community's needs for over 50 years. That's been worked on primarily by the trustees of Riverside Cemetery, uh, by Deborah Lane, our town clerk, and also by Moore and Saradin, a, a private firm that we've been using on that. Uh, we made tremendous progress this year on getting a better handle on what our property issues are in the community. Uh, this is in the form of the council having approved the purchase of a computer software program uh, that now enables us to keep much, much better track of all our properties, to be sure that we're making proper investments in them, and to ensure that in the longer term we're going to be saving money by ensuring that the town and school are working together and by assuring that we don't get into situations that the buildings aren't being properly maintained. Uh, this year also saw the, reno the, the completion of the renovation of the elementary and middle schools with the basement of the middle school uh, work about to be completed where community services activities and programs will be moving to as well as the top floor of the, the old 30s building of the middle school that's now being used for classrooms. Uh, which is, this is the opposite end of the building. Uh, the, the end that was renovated was the old section known as the 30s building or, or the high school. Much of what was done in Cape Elizabeth this year also is, is in the, the manner or the practice of enhancing livability in, in the community, making Cape Elizabeth a good, pleasant place to live. Uh, this included new fields uh, that have been constructed at both Fort Williams Park and at Lions Field. Uh, that again was done by a lot of folks working together and those will be, be able to be used in 1999. Uh, the pond, a, a problem that existed for many years, people looked at it at Fort Williams and said how terrible it looked. There's now a beautiful stone wall uh, that now surrounds that particular pond. Uh, the cliff walk at, at Fort Williams Park, uh, you know, I, every, I was down in Washington, many of you know, this past weekend, and I, I even heard there someone who had walked on that cliff walk and how much they enjoyed it. The tennis courts as well were repaired at Fort Williams, and lastly, the pool. Uh, was approved by the citizens uh, for a $2.2 million renovation. And, you know, I think as you look at the, those projects, they're used by all different ages in the community, and they're, they're also something that, you know, each of them uh, will definitely be around here for, you know, for generations to come in terms of, in terms of helping people. You know, in addition to looking at the future, there was, uh, there was also many efforts to help preserve the past in the community. Uh, this past year. Uh, the Sparrowing Church, which is depicted below, the, the roof was repaired in a major way for the first time since 1834. Uh, something that, you know, certainly was significant was done in a historically appropriate way. The Council also formed an Historic Ordinance Study Committee that will be meeting in co coming months to look at how our historic homes might be protected. Uh, an issue that councilors have started receiving phone calls about. Uh, there was a tower committee that is looking at telecommunication issues in the community. Uh, there's a Fort Use study underway. Former council chairman Beyer uh, was, was very uh, concerned, as well as other members of the council, in looking at are we appropriately using Fort Williams in terms of uh, its expense to the community and, and possible uh, revenues. We also recognize that we, we've had a number of problems with our roads, that some of the maintenance is falling behind on those. You like those graphics. <laughs> at, at one point, when I first put this together, we had that uh, bulldozer, uh, not a roller, compact, rolling in from the side. I just I was a little too dramatic. <laughs> anyway, uh, there was a reclamation project down on Eastman Road. Another one done on Sawyer Road, extending from the Rodden Gun Club down to the Scarborough town line. There was a paving of uh, many streets throughout the community, 
including most of Brentwood, a portion of Mitchell Road, Preble Street, uh, Todd Road, which I almost left off, but I didn't want to forget that. Excuse me? Hannaford Cove Road. And, you know, it's something that still needs uh, quite more attention. We also, you know, really pride ourselves as a community in responding to citizens' needs. Uh, one of the, the major challenges this past year was the ice storm. And although we weren't hit by the first storm, we were, we were hit tremendously by the second storm. And, you know, we, we opened a shelter and everyone pulled together to uh, help out in, in that endeavor. Uh, many have already forgotten a fall windstorm that we had that destroyed many, many trees in the, particularly over in the Oakhurst area, Cape Cottage Woods section of the community. You know, it, it almost was not an event here in Cape Elizabeth because Public Works was so quick to get, up, get out there and clean it up and to attend to all the needs that occurred. Uh, similarly, a fall rainstorm, of which, you know, the, the Council still will be dealing with some policy issues uh, regarding that this evening. Uh, it's, it's interesting, responding to needs, I was thinking of some of the some of the things and you know some of the department has gave me pictures and you know we responded to everything from a boat that was ashore at Trundy Point to a whale that was at Crescent Beach that we we sat there and watched for I don't know 24 hours or so when we think it went back out to sea and we think it survived but it's, it's just an instance of all the different needs that the town responds to uh, responding to the less fortunate uh, such things as holiday baskets uh, some of the work that was done with the Thomas Jordan Trust. And really the point is, is that all of this is no matter what happens in this community, we're ready 24 hours a day to respond to what, whatever issue uh, should arise. Uh, even, even trying to help out individuals. Uh, sadly, one of our employees' uh, daughter was, was stricken with a, a very severe disease and there was, there was uh, the, necess the necessity to raise some money to help the travel expenses relating to her care. And many of the volunteers who already work for the community, the town employees, went out and worked uh, and did a bottle drive. And the citizens to that bottle drive donated uh, over a couple thousand dollars, uh, again, responding to needs. I think Cape Elizabeth also really does a unique job on communications. Uh, we work very, very closely with the courier. And you know, I think as, as everyone sees every issue of the courier, you can see that there's a real effort to get the news out about Dif different issues in the community. Uh, similarly, one of the council goals was to televise meetings of the zoning board, and this happened for the first time last month uh, during November. Uh, one interesting project this year was an extensive citizen survey, and it, it was unbelievable the response that Cape Elizabeth citizens provided to that survey in terms of the number that responded and the obvious, when you read the comments, how much people really care about what goes on in Cape Elizabeth. So it, it was very helpful and uh, a very good process. Uh, we also do extensive meeting notice, that noticing that I think goes beyond any community at all. Uh, one of the things unique about Cape Elizabeth is the progress that we've been making on our webpage, www.capeelizabeth.com. If you're watching this meeting this evening and want to know what's on this town council agenda, you can look at that address. You can hit the agenda button, and there is the agenda for this evening's meeting, as well as the minutes of uh, recent meetings. Uh, all of the town's ordinances are now available for anyone to read and to be able to do a search on their home computer without having to come into the office and purchase it. There's near daily updating of news stories. If you look at the home page, you'll find that the stories of things that have happened within the last day or two. In fact, in the council packets this, uh, for this meeting, were some, were some stories that I found out about them by reading them on the web page as a result of the efforts of our webmaster. Uh, one thing that was, you know, an example, election results. Debbie was making the phone calls about the election results, and I'm on the list apparently way, way down to get them. And they were already on the web, and I already knew them before she called. So, you know, just an indication of the progress we're making. We're also web page and so much it's fully integrated with the school department, their efforts. We really do try to make use of as many resources as we can. This year, there were major donations for fields, for the cliff walk, uh, for the work that was done on the pond at Fort Williams Park. Uh, it's just unbelievable the number of volunteers that we have that work on boards and commissions, that serve on the fire call companies, that also are working on the volunteer rescue, the wet team, 
and the fire police unit. And with the exception of the fire call companies and the town council, who, who earns $350 a year, all of these individuals do it for absolutely no remuneration. And certainly the councilors' expenses far exceed the small remuneration that they receive. This is a photo of one of our uh, most generous benefactors this year, Gus Barber, who, while it was important and crucial that he gave the money for the cliff walk, what's, what's even more important is that he had the vision to make it happen. It was his idea. It wasn't like someone going to him, wouldn't you like to do this? This was his idea. He put it all together. We uh, also dealt with a number of fiscal issues this year. Uh, there was a refinancing of some of our debt that saved $237,000. Uh, this is the one sad piece of news. I wouldn't dare leave it out. Uh, we had an overall tax increase of 3.41%. That was primarily due to uh, increases that were on the school side as a result of declining state subsidies, as well as the purchase of the Levitt property and the improvements that are planned for that in the swimming pool. Uh, we have a fiscal plan looking at how all these major improvements might be undertaken. Uh, the tax rate for ongoing municipal services actually decreased uh, nearly 3%, which uh, you know, I think is good even in our times of low inflation. Uh, citizens have been doing an excellent job paying their taxes, and that resulted in a reaffirmation of the, the best bond rating for any community of our size in the state of Maine, where, where we have absolutely no peers in terms of our, our bond rating. Uh, we also served as a Simply by doing it, we became a model for the administration of the new homestead uh, exemption program. Uh, when the assessing offices met in Augusta at the MMA convention, they asked the Cape Elizabeth assessor to be a presenter to indicate how the program was done here because it was recognized as such a model and we did have such a very, very high rate of participation on that. We also had a number of transitions this year. Uh, there's Bill Jordan. Uh, Billy, uh, we all know, retired from the town council. Uh, Ruth Watts and Penny Carson were elected. Ruth sort of replacing Billy Jordan and uh, Penny Carson replacing Bill Byer when he moved uh, to New Hampshire. Uh, Charlie Greer retired from the school board and was replaced by, uh, with Jennifer Rice uh, to, to Senna. Jane Beckwith, a long, long time employee at the Thomas Memorial Library, retired. We have a new tree warden, Tom Nee, replaced uh, Rick Churchill. And it's not on one of the slides, but we, we're also, at the end of the year, uh, we'll be getting a new director of emergency preparedness. All of this happens by working together. Uh, a lot of that involves relations with employees. Uh, we, we have a new police contract, resolved a number of longstanding issues there. Uh, the council always expresses concern about the budget, and even since the budget was adopted, we changed some of our personnel staffing in saving 520 annual hours of uh, staff time without any change in, in services. Uh, we made great strides, as I mentioned, on working on facilities management school in town. We worked with the school department on doing computer upgrades. Really appreciate Gary Lenoy's assistance uh, in that regard. Uh, mutual aid really makes a difference in terms of the rescue and in terms of fire and to a lesser extent in, in terms of police. We also had a number of events and celebrations here in Cape Elizabeth this year. A major challenge that I think you know, everyone recognized was ended up to be a lot of fun and really unique for the community was the, uh, be the People's Beach to Beacon Road Race uh, held the 1st of August. We had a, another very successful, uh, successful family fun day. Uh, we had art shows at the Thomas Memorial Library. There's one over there uh, this month that has the Engine One Company's art collection that they have done through their proceeds from sponsoring the art show. Uh, it's a very unique collection. Uh, we also, again, had the symphony, and you know, it, was, it was a year of much, uh, much celebration. Uh, the town also received a number of awards and honors this past year. Uh, our planning, uh, or I do, you do like those graphics, <laughs> for our new zoning ordinance, won the Northern New England Planning Association's Project of the Year for the work that was done uh, on Cape Elizabeth's new zoning ordinance. Rosemary Reed, Councillor Rosemary Reed, won an award from the Walmart Foundation for her work uh, on the bottle shed, really as a private citizen more than a councillor. Jay Shermer, our librarian at the Thomas Library, was elected the vice president 
of the Maine Library Association and uh, Chief Pickering uh, was elected to head the Maine Chiefs of Police Association. And in addition, I didn't put this out there, probably shouldn't have, but, but it does take a lot of time. I'll be serving as a uh, leader in the Rotary uh, District this coming year. But uh, I thought it might be interesting to look at, you know, it, when I've looked at 1998, it's, uh, you know, I had a list three times at length, but I've already gone on for 15 minutes, and, you know, I could have put so, more, so much more. There was, an, I think, an awful lot accomplished. What's going to happen in 1999? Uh, these are headlines. I tried to put them in headline form. Some, some things just don't work. Uh, <laughs> The, the Donald Richards Community Swimming Pool at Cape Elizabeth High School. Renovations are, uh, will, will most likely be done this past year. That it'll be going out to bid relatively soon. Uh, the Town Center Sidewalk Project that's been talked about for years and years is finally at a point that it should be able to be put out to bid early uh, this spring. Uh, the Levitt property, we would hope that we might receive permits uh, during this year to undertake all of that work. The second annual Beach to Beacon Road Race will be held. Uh, that's been already been approved uh, for uh, the first Saturday in August. Council acts on town farm report. Uh, you have a committee looking at that. There's going to be a program in 1999 for the first time for citizens to be able to dispose of uh, various household hazardous waste. The rescue unit is going to be developing a strategic plan. And the fourth centennial is going to end the millennium. Uh, the cooperation that we have during all the different issues, the people who work directly for the community, either paid or, or unpaid, uh, it, it really all works, works together. So to all those who assisted, I, I do want to thank them and uh, hope that in 1999 that we'll have as good a year as we had in 1998. Happy holidays to everyone. So thank you. First order of business is the uh, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting of November 9th, 1998. Is there such a motion? I move to uh, move the uh, to approve the uh, minutes of the uh, last meeting. What is it, November 9th? Councilman McGinty. I'd second that, but I think there's one change that needs to be made. We've, um, Councilor Reed was absent, is that correct? Yes, I was. Yeah, and it indicates that you were present. Oh, sorry. I wasn't spared, but. With that, uh, with that amendment. Uh, I'd... All right. All in favor? Opposed? <clears throat> and it's are approved. Item number 66, <coughs> approval of annual liquor and special amusement permits for the Inn by the Sea property in the names of Susan Legg of Vince Inc. and Fort Fairfield Yacht Club. Mr. McGovern. Yeah, Ms. Lane will be handling this one. Ms. Lane. Thank you very much. Uh, before the town council tonight is the renewal of the Mart Malt, Spiritus, and Vinous Liquor License. Um, for Susan Lake events at In by the Sea. The application is complete. Um, it is at this time that we would, through the chairman obviously, invite any um, citizens' comments on this application. And beyond that, I would recommend that the council approve this as presented. Are there any citizen comments on this application? Hearing none, is there a motion? Councilor Reed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move acceptance Second. of the approval. Second. Second. 
Councilor Watson? Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Seven to nothing. <coughs> Item number 67, consideration of the proposed engineering services agreement for new public works facility and adjacent recreational fields, trails, and parking areas. Mr. McGovern. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. After a discussion, uh, some discussion of this, I'm going to ask that it be tabled uh, to the next meeting. Uh, I, I just want to make clear that I didn't have an expectation that this would be approved this evening. <coughs> And I, you know, really would like to hear any comments the council may have. Uh, I also think it's timely to be tabled and for you to have a, be able to have a look at it for two successive months, because next month you'll be looking in a formal way at the proposed master plan for the former Levitt property. Uh, and I think it'll be very good for you to consider both this draft contract or the draft that's in place at that time, uh, along with the master plan. Uh, when First of all, how, how this came about, back in, on April 15th of 1998, the town issued a request for proposals to develop a master plan for the Levitt property and uh, schematic design and the design development phase of work, not only on this property, but also for the new uh, fire station and police station. Uh, we ended up sending out, I believe, a total of 22 copies of that request for proposals as it was advertised in the newspaper. The Facilities 2000 Committee then interviewed, I don't recall, it was either five or six firms and decided to, to recommend to the Council at that point that OST Associates be hired. Uh, it was, and let me read this, uh, the final paragraph of that indicates uh, headed <coughs> continuing work. It is anticipated but not guaranteed that the firm selected to work with the town on this phase of this multifaceted project will move forward to final design and construction services for the public works, police, and fire facilities, and for the construction of the athletic fields. There's, there's absolutely no requirement that we continue with OST. Uh, so, you know, obviously, you know, we, we still are in a negotiation phase with them, and, you know, my sense is very definitely that I would like to continue with them on the public works and Levitt portion property without making any comment at this point in time on the remainder of the property. Uh, obviously, you know, that, that is subject to this, their agreeing to any conditions that the town might require, uh, any, any changes in the amounts of the contract, as well as, you know, in the end, it needs to be approved by the town council and they need to understand that without that approval uh, that, you know, this would not be a go. Uh, one reason for all of that introduction, I think it's, it's a little bit shocking when, any, when anyone looks at this and sees that it adds up to a total of $301,000. Uh, I think it, it's th therefore, you know, really important that we, we look at the details of the scope of services. And in Exhibit A, it's listed in uh, great, great depth as to what's included in this. You know, it's not only a new public works department facility, uh, but it's also recreational ball fields, tennis courts, trails, parking area, access drives. It's very complicated permitting, including site plan approval from the planning board, a site location of development approval from the main DEP, a notice of intent from the EPA for a uh, stormwater discharge, a wetlands alteration permit uh, from the planning board, a main department environmental protection NRPA permit, uh, for, for wetlands alterations. Uh, it's, it's a very complicated process. It also, I don't think I mentioned, includes a, uh, a sewer extension uh, that, that would not only serve this but also the transfer station. The portion of it that's attributable to the Public Works Department facility is $117,400. The portion that is for the recreational facilities is $86,600, permitting $21,000, and that's the direct cost of the inter, the inter relations uh, with those agencies. It's not all of the things that you need to be doing in the other projects in order to be at the point where you can file for a permit. It also includes the actual construction monitoring of the project to make sure it's all done. And construction administration, all of the testing that needs to be done during construction, that's 76000 So 301000 you know, it, at first is, is a big, you know, that's a lot of money. But I think once you begin to look at it, you realize that, you know, there is, there is quite a bit to this. Uh, what it, I probably could go into more detail. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, stop at this point 
and see if the council members have uh, any concerns. It is also being reviewed, I should mention, by the town's attorney to make sure that uh, everything is, is appropriate in this, as well as uh, tomorrow night at a meeting of the Facilities 2000 Committee. Council. I attended, you know, some of the meetings of the Facilities 2000 Committee and, and some of the um, selection process that they went through. And I, I'm wondering how this, well, first of all, this doesn't include the amount for renovating the current public works and the current police station. So how much additional do we, are we talking about there? And I realize we're only doing this part of it. Is that correct? That's and, um, and I, I, what I'm really wondering is how this compares to their discussions and comparison of firms. Is this consistent with their choice of firms? Yeah. It, when we did the pricing for sort of phase one, two, and three, where we are now, the master plan, the, the schematic, and the, the beginning of design development. We did receive prices from every firm, and they have been consistent with those prices. We did not specifically ask for, at that time, pricing for all of the project from there out. That's, that's generally not done. Uh, what, what you do need to look at is what is the, per, the estimated percentage cost of what this work will cost as a, per, as a percentage of what the work will cost. This appears to be r almost exactly on the percentage, if not a little below, what, the, what you would pay to, uh, you know, based on the, the state schedule uh, for, through, through the Bureau of General Services. The, the, portion, the other portion of your question, for the other, you know, that's still subject to discussion. And you know, it's still very much subject to discussion. The other piece is of your question, the other portion of your question, was what about how much will it cost for the remaining buildings? Some of that will be dependent on how those projects evolve. I know when, when you had your workshop discussion, there was some discussion as to, you know, what will be the level of effort. And, you know, for that reason, I think it's, for that reason, we, we really don't have a, have a feel on what the cost is going to be of those projects ultimately because we don't know their scope. I think it's very important to separate it. Also, you know, I think different firms have better expertise in certain areas. And I think for this type of work, OST clearly has the expertise. I think, you know, it'd be improper to make a judgment on whether or not they have the, the expertise to the extent we would like for the fire and police components until they have completed that work. From the chair's point of view, I would like to see uh, this item tabled because I would like the uh, Facilities 2000 group to review this contract and get back to the town council if they have any thoughts, additions, or concerns. So I think it's a little bit of the cart before the horse for the town council to discuss this in detail tonight and would certainly entertain a motion to table this to next month. Councilor Reed. So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to table uh, item 67 until next month's meeting. Further discussion? Uh, Councilor Barry. Has any thought been given to uh, putting this out to bid for such a huge amount of money? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I wonder about uh, developing a policy of some sort where in excess of a certain amount of money, uh, I mean, maybe $25,000 uh, just to pick a number from the air. Uh, putting these uh, matters out for bid for, uh, I, I realize that uh, there are some uh, specialized needs for expertise in some areas, but uh, this can't be the only, I mean, when you have a, a monopoly, the price goes up. Well, being on the committee and knowing the effort they went through to select, uh, in fact, they did in effect have a bidding process. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this particular group was picked. But again, it was not with the caveat that they would be awarded uh, all services down the line concerning this project, and that could be re-reviewed at any time. Mm. That's why I personally would be anxious to see this to get back before the 2000 group, Committee 2000 group 
and see what they have to say about this and then have that discussion at next month's meeting. I agree. That's why I second the motion. I, I know a motion to table is not debatable, but I, I would like to publicly say that I received telephone calls from three different counselors today all expressing concern about the amount of this contract. Mm. That is definitely something that I will be discussing uh, in reviewing uh, prior to this returning to you. So further discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Item uh, voted 7 to nothing to table item 67 until next month's meeting. Okay. Item 68, acceptance of gifts and donations received in 1998. Madam Clerk. Thank you very much. It is at this meeting annually that the Town Council is presented with gifts and donations that have been presented to the various town departments for the fiscal, uh, I'm sorry, for the previous calendar year, or the current calendar year. Uh, just to very briefly, for the public's um, awareness, we are looking at the acceptance of the Cliff Walk donations from Gus Barber, various donations to the fire and police departments. Uh, Portland Headlight, the Thomas Memorial Library, Riverside Memorial Cemetery, um, Fort William Centennial donations. Those are actually still coming in um, this evening on the Diaz was an updated list, uh, primarily, primarily to include Fort William Centennial donations through today. Oakhurst Dairy Tree Relief, uh, Walmart Foundation, uh, the South Portland Cape Elizabeth Rotary has donated bleachers at Lions Field and to be received this month $10,000 toward the garden pond at Fort Williams and Keneally Photography and Imaging donated uh, professional services to Cliff Walk Gifts. So as always, um, we are very appreciative of these gifts and very thankful to residents, businesses and some non-residents that have contributed this past year as well. So I would recommend <coughs> the council accept these gifts. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, I just received a, a check this month for uh, six months of work, I guess. I'd like to donate that. I didn't get a chance to get it in to the Fields for Kids. And I would like to have it recorded in the minutes, not that I am a, a South Portland resident. That's where my office is. But I am a resident of Cape Elizabeth on Two Lights Road. Thank you very much. Thank you. Six months salary gone. Also, I should know. <laughs> I think mine went in one fell swoop to uh, Cape for Kids for the three years. But I should add for the members of the community that uh, the Field for Kids fundraising campaign um, now totals approximately $117,000 that's been raised primarily in uh, individual grants, some, some businesses that are much appreciated, but that is a colossal effort for a community of this size. And um, as Mr. McGovern indicated in his review of the year, um, many good things happen in Cape Elizabeth, but they happen in large part because the citizens of this town caused them to happen. And then our employees are able to do so much more. Uh, Councilor Reed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was just wondering, uh, in addition to the $117,000 that the residents have contributed and businesses, do we have an approximate value so the members of the audience might know the level of generosity of the other gifts? I didn't see a grand total, and I was just wondering. For which ones? For the oh. cash uh, contributions in total for the year, just to give a rough example. The, the total amount of contributions for all purposes and I just think it would be important for people to see the level of commitment that people have on a voluntary basis and it's right now I'd say it's around two hundred two hundred and ten thousand dollars in voluntary contributions for one year for one year thank you is there a motion to accept these gifts I move that the gifts be accepted second second Councilor Watson further discussion hearing none oh Rose Councilor Reed. Could we um, add with gratitude? Yes. We can always add with gratitude. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the minutes will so reflect. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed? Well, we accepted those gifts unanimously. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. We're on a roll. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Item 69. 
Action upon a report from the Appointments Committee to fill vacancies on boards and commissions. Councilor Reed. Yes, Mr. Chairman, and in addition to the wonderful generosity that we have just had uh, expressed in rough terms as over $200,000, uh, I would also like to point out that we have numerous hours of volunteer time by professionals and executives, business people, homemakers, etc., cetera, uh, every single month. And as always, we have a tremendous uh, group of people to um, appoint, and I would like to know if the council would like to hear the entire list, including reappointments, or just those which are new appointments. Well, I think uh, I'll speak for the entire, the list isn't that long, and I think this is a good opportunity for uh, some small amount of recognition for those members that have been appointed previously, and also informs the, the town as to who these various individuals are on these boards. So I, I would suggest you read them all. Thank you. Uh, a new appointment list would include the Zoning Board of Appeals, Jack Keneally and Ann <coughs> Elderkin for the Arts Commission, Cynthia Chadwick for the Family Fun Day Committee, Susan Lowe for the Recycling Committee, John Barrett for the Thomas Memorial Library Trustees, Susan Lowe. And that's not a typo. She has uh, accepted two positions. Uh, we would also like to thank the uh, reappointees who are Ann Kerner for the Assessment Review Board, Virginia Hansen for the Arts Commission, Mike Alfiero for the Community Services along with Karen Dumphy. The Conservation Commission has three members who are being reappointed, Robert Harrison, John Herrick, and Gary Punsky. The Fort Williams Advisory Commission, Dan Fisher and Al Barthelman. The Planning Board, Mark Wilcox and Peter Cotter have agreed to serve again. The Riverside Cemetery trustees include Jane Jordan, Wayne Brooking, the Recycling Committee, Julia Beckett, Thomas Memorial Library trustees, Anne Swift Kayetta serving another term, and Rachel Stamieskin. The uh, Zoning Board of Appeals reappointment is Amory Houghton. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barry, uh, I move that uh, all of these appointments uh, be accepted by the council, and I've, I've served on the uh, appointments committee with Councilor Reed, and I, I'm most impressed with the caliber of citizens that have come forward from the community to serve on these committees. I think they have a wonderful job, and uh, certainly shows community commitment. It's been moved and seconded to uh, appoint and reappoint the various individuals to these boards and commissions as recommended by the Appointments Committee. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Congratulations to all those individuals who are newly appointed and my thanks to those that are reappointed. Item number 70, a review of requests from the Arts Commission for the town to publish a book of artistic works. Mr. McGovern. Yes, uh, this proposal has come from the Arts Commission, one of the town's volunteer boards. Uh, there are two members here uh, this evening representing uh, the Arts Commission, Ashley Werner Collins and uh, Bill Barton. <laughs> I, I know Bill very well. I have one of his paintings hanging in my office, but <laughs> moment's hesitation there. Uh, they're here to pro provide a brief overview of, uh, of what they've proposed. Please feel free to come to the podium. Um, all the members of the town council have been uh, uh, or have received your written submission, but we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Um, my name is Ashley Werner Collins, and on behalf of the Cape Elizabeth Arts Commission, I'm here to present a proposal uh, for uh, the Arts Commission to produce a publication of artistic works by Cape residents. Our goal in producing this work, which we have a working title of right now is Reflections of Cape Elizabeth, is not um, to, to make an historical publication um, of Cape Elizabeth, but more a publication um, representing the modern day experiences of our town residents and employees seen through their artistic expression. Our goals in this project are to promote and build community involvement in the arts and creative development, to honor the skills of our community, 
to support the diversity of artistic expression within our community, to raise awareness within and outside of the community of the beauty and unique characteristics of Cape Elizabeth, to produce an artistically based product with long-term financial and market value for Cape Elizabeth, and to provide the town with an artistic record of our town's changing environment. The format that we have chosen um, is outlined in your proposal. Uh, it's basically um, sort of as a summary, very similar to a museum type catalog as you might see here. Um, there should have been a, um, a couple of dummy books that were handed out with the um, proposal and I'm not sure if they arrived in your hands, but that is a representation of an artistic um, museum catalog where there'd be both visual um, representation as well as textual information. <coughs> Um, it would be an eight and a half by 11 horizontal um, book, landscape book with high quality paper, um, non-glossy so that the artistic works can be represented clear, reproduced clearly. Um, it would have strong graphic appeal and would also include um, uh, strong layout in terms of the, the combination of visual works and textual literary works. We, um, we would like to ask for a grant or loan, will it be of $22,000? This is to cover the costs of um, production, primarily in the photography of the, of the visual artwork, the um, graphic designer, and the printing and publishing of the publication. All of that, the details of that have been laid out in the proposal. And I'm happy to restate them for you you would wish. We intend to repay the town of that $22,000 through the sale and proceeds of the um, book's publication. Questions? Councilor Reed. Ashley, thank you very much. I've uh, had several discussions with one of your co-chairs about this project, and um, I do know that there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of work has been done. However, um, as a matter of information gathering, et cetera, I would ask that the council consider uh, referring this to workshop where we're asking for a commitment that uh, needs to be discussed either in loan or a uh, uh, combination of um, loan, grant, aid, et cetera. And uh, I just think that uh, as finance chair, I would personally like to see it discussed in a little more detail, not necessarily the scope of the project, but the cost and the funding vehicle. Further discussion? Council Watson. I too would like to see it go to, to workshop and just to flesh out the, the project a little bit more. Not that we need more information. I think it was very well prepared what you've done. However, I think that it would be very helpful to sit down and, and discuss just, you know, where the $22,000 would go and, and how best we could maybe make this work, what kind of format um, would be most successful. So in terms of the costs of um, you know, how we came to our conclusions of the different values? For One of the questions that I have is um, currently with this projection of 1,000 copies, uh, at 22000 would cost $22 each for each project just to break even. Mm -hmm. And a concern that I have is, um, do, have you uh, determined your, uh, your audience and their willingness to pay you know, $22, $22 for the book? Just um, some questions that I, I, would, I would, would like more answers to that I think we could work at, in a workshop at. Councilor Reed. Uh, and Ashley, I'll just give you an example of mine. Um, the discussions that I've had previously with your staff contact as well as with members of the Art Commission have been closer to a $15,000 figure than the 22000 mm -hmm. And I, I don't even know all the questions yet to ask. <laughs> and this proposal is great, and it certainly gives us a lot of information. But unfortunately, I sometimes need time to sort of think. And uh, I haven't had the benefit of the several months you know, mm -hmm. that the Commission members have and would just would like to be free to ask some questions without uh, that would be fine too much trouble further discussion 
Councilor McGinty. I'd support sending this to workshop. I have many of the same questions that uh, Councilor Watson had, so I, I could uh, support a workshop. Yeah. Is there a motion? Councilor Reed. I, I move that we receive the report and um, that we set a workshop date at the earliest possible convenience. That we all understand that will be uh, sometime after the holidays. As long as it's after the holidays. <laughs> Is there a second to, with the after the holidays added? Second. A second. Uh, further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's seven to nothing. The uh, uh, report is received, and a workshop will be set up uh, as early in the new year as possible. Um, on behalf of the town council, I'd like to thank you very much for your thank you. effort tonight, and we look forward to further discussing this project with you. Thank you. How, who shall I contact regarding the workshop? Mr. McGovern. Okay. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, as soon as it's scheduled, I'll let everyone on the Arts Commission know. Okay, great. Thank you. May I just make one comment? I just think that it's important that members of the Act Commission understand that by us pushing it beyond the calendar year, we have not missed the budget cycle or the discussions regarding this. It's simply, you know, just a matter of the calendar changing, not the fiscal year. We, we're in a fiscal year calendar, not our budget, not a yeah. the calendar January, calendar not a calendar calendar year. Great. So. Through the end of June. Great. Thank you. I, I think even before the workshop, what I'll try to do is to get together with the co-chairs and with the chairman of the finance committee and myself because you know we've I think you know <clears throat> Councillor Watson, Councillor Reed, Councillor McGinty and others have you know expressed some issues and if we can try to work some of those out so at least everyone understands so there aren't any surprises at the workshop it'd be helpful. Or at least before the workshop whatever additional information if there is additional information it can be placed in all the councillors' right. hands. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, Item 71, consideration of matters relating to subdivision of property owned by the Sprague Corporation. Mr. McGovern. Yeah, th this is, that's a misnomer on the, the agenda. It's actually a matter. It's not matters. Uh, but we usually use that language whenever we have issues involving subdivisions. The Sprague Corporation has been working with the planning board for some time on a proposed subdivision of their property. Uh, oftentimes, a number of issues uh, come to the council. In, in this case, because of the uniqueness of this family land use plan that constitutes a subdivision under our laws, uh, the only real matter that's, that comes before uh, the council at this time is, is the issue of a drainage easement. Uh, this drainage easement would be located approximately a third of a mile in from uh, Bowery Beach Road. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly standard drainage easement, nothing really unique about it. And you know what it does, it gives us the the right to go in there and to maintain the drainage structures to keep them clear, to put the water within this area of the, the drainage uh, area. It's, it's very, you know, generally very standard, very routine. Uh, Mike Hill, who works with Tom Leahy, our town attorney, uh, did submit a letter just today that I received today uh, with some pro proposed language changes. Uh, what's before the council is, is the conditional acceptance of this. It would still have to eventually come back to you for, for final acceptance at the time the rest of the subdivision goes forward. This merely says to the planning board, yes, you know, we'll accept a drainage easement in this area. And, uh, you know, what I'd like to do is, is work out the, uh, the language with Mike Hill and with, this, with the Sprague uh, Corporation's representatives. And again, but the final language will come back to you. But I think, you know, it, it is, it does seem to me it would not be inappropriate uh, even without the final language to indicate to, to enable us to indicate to the planning board that it is your intent to accept the drainage easement uh, in this area at the appropriate time. With the appropriate language? With the appropriate language, satisfactory to the town attorney. Is there a motion in, to that effect? Councilor Reed. Um, I'll move the conditional acceptance of the drainage easement presented um, by the uh, Sprague Corporation with the appropriate legal language. Uh, confirmed by the town attorney. I'll second that. Councilor McGinty uh, seconds. Further discussion? Can I just ask a question? I've read all the, the legalese here, but uh, about where is this? I mean, in real terms, in everyday people <laughs> language, just generally. John, why don't you come on up? Just, just real quick, John, just name a couple of roads that's between. It's approximately a quarter of a mile uh, down from Sprague Hall on the right. 
Um, there's a, a gated field there, and it's located just beyond that. It's the first field on the right as you drive down from Sprague Hall okay. on Fowler Road Extension. Got it. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed? Unanimous, seven to nothing. Item number 72, approval of the appointment of a Director of Emergency Preparedness. <coughs> Mr. McGovern. Yes, uh, under the town charter and the, the section of the administrative code and the code of ordinances dealing with department heads, the Director of Emergency Preparedness is a uh, Cape Elizabeth department head. Uh, under the charter, I make the appointment subject to the approval of the town council. I'm pleased to recommend uh, to replace Greg Kinsman, who has resigned effective at the end of this calendar year, uh, uh, A. Charles Kennedy of 36 Thrasher Road, known to most people as Charlie Kennedy. Uh, I think Charlie brings very unique qualifications. He's an executive with Key Bank, uh, who deals with government relations as the Community Reinvestment Act officer. Uh, he previously served as the Director of Governmental Affairs for Casco Northern Bank uh, here, in this, here in the state of Maine. Uh, I think he has a record of community service. Uh, he's just joined the rescue as a driver. Uh, he's also been a member, uh, helping out Greg, of uh, the emergency management team in the community. Uh, he's a member of our fire police unit, was just elected the president of that to replace Lee Chase, who's retiring after eight years as head of the fire police unit. He's been involved in, with United Way, all sorts of different committees and whatever. Uh, I've discussed it uh, with the public safety chiefs uh, who were very pleased that he stepped forward to do this. And I've also had quite extensive discussions with him as to what my expectations are of the position, uh, working on disaster planning and everything from that to uh, Y2K, in case that should become a problem. So uh, we've had some good discussions. So the request would be for the count, town council to approve your recommendation. Approve the appointment. Approve the appointment. Is there a motion in that? I'll, that move. Move? I'll move. Councilor McGinty and second by Councilor Fritz. Further discussion? Uh, uh, Councilor Barry. It's, uh, I wonder if the town manager could just quickly give us uh, 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 more uh, specifics on the duties of the office. Yes, I'd be happy to. For the to. folks at home, I think it might be helpful. Yes. The Director of Emergency Preparedness is responsible for our disaster planning efforts in the community. Uh, that involves everything from uh, the nuclear bombs coming from uh, overseas, which is very much a, a lesser phase to this point, to uh, how we deal with, with the regular run-of-the-mill storms that we seem to get these days. Uh, I've asked Mr. Kennedy, for, for, by way of example, I've asked him to look very closely at all of our disaster plans. Uh, I've asked him to look at, to take an inventory of all our equipment. We have quite a bit at the, the civil defense bunker. To determine in the longer range whether or not that's an appropriate location uh, for our civil defense department, the bunker right on the ocean at Fort Williams. Uh, I've asked him, as I mentioned, to look at uh, year 2K issues. Uh, and does that give you that give you the example? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. And I've also indicated to him that one of his chief responsibilities is to give the rest of us early notice of an upcoming disaster. Uh, sometimes, you know, the, the civil defense network does get uh, a lot earlier notice than, than we get of, of something coming. So, and they, so it works well. Councilor Reed. Uh, just for those who might be wondering, uh, a person who has this much responsibility. Uh, the reason it's the town manager's appointment is this is a stipended position. That's correct. It pays, I don't remember the exact amount, but it's approximately $1,200 per year. So it's not an hourly and it's not a volunteer. It's That's stipended right. and... Stipend. Paid uh, twice annually, just as the council is. Councilor McGinty. I'd just like to make a comment. Uh, Mike stole um, most of the thunder here about the qualifications of Charlie, and he just did join the rescue and got the normal a little bit better. And I mean, he's, this is really the, the quality of the individual and all the community services, things. I mean, he just step back to his, his regular resume for what he does in real life mm -hmm. and all the community service he puts in and Mike hit on most of them. And, um, you know, it's just amazing. I wish I had his energy, I'll tell you. That's, that's great. Uh, well, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? 
Opposed? It's unanimous, seven to nothing. Um, item number 73, request from town manager to set aside funds for the Fallower Road Reclamation Project and for a replacement dump truck. Mr. McGovern. As I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, that the town is, is in really good financial shape. Uh, last year, we found ourselves under the recommended amount for undesignated surplus. Uh, we had worked for like eight <coughs> years to get to the recommended amount, and then as a result of purchasing the Levitt property, we went back under. However, at the time the bond refinancing was done, though, that money was replenished because the, the, the promise was that the, that property purchase would be paid for over time and not by the tax base at that time. So we're in good shape. So I've done, as, as the Council can see, some projections of where we are with surplus. Uh, when, we, when we've been going over the capital improvement plan, which, which the details are still being worked on, it, it was immediately obvious that there were a couple of big ticket items that we, we really do need to reserve funds for and move forward with. One is a truck, which I'll defer to Bob to explain, and the other is for Fowler Road. Some of you may recall a couple of years ago, a lot of intense interest on Fowler Road from the <coughs> citizens of that street uh, in terms of what should be done with it. And uh, after a lot of discussion, meetings, they, rec they agreed that what we ought to do is wait till we get the, the federal and state funds uh, and we would do some temporary repair. The council went ahead with that plan and I think funded, I think it was $10,000 and there was some minor paving that was done that, that took the worst sting out of the problem. Uh, at the meeting of PACS, the Regional Transportation Planning and Funding Agency, last month, uh, they agreed to include PACS as the, the reclamation of Fowler Road as a PAX project at the $600,000 level. Uh, work on feeder streets such as Fowler Road requires a 25% match or $150,000. Uh, this work is not going to be immediately done, but I, but I do feel it's important to set aside the funds to, to indicate a reaffirmation to the state that the town is behind this project to give the confidence to the citizens that it's going to be done. And this is juxtaposition with a situation we've been dealing on Tides Edge Road that some of you may have seen a letter recently that, come on guys, you promised it needs to be done. Well, I don't want to put that project off for another year. I, you know, the citizens were told it, it was going to be done last year. It wasn't because the roads were falling apart. And I, I really want to, to see that Fowler Road is, is, is done just as quickly as the state's ready to do it. When is your, when do you believe that uh, $150,000, and if I understand you correctly, that would generate $600,000 in tax money, when do you anticipate that that would actually be spent? I'm going to push aggressively for it to be done during the next construction year. All right. So it's I, truly, I, truly I, is a reserve at this point in time. It's a reserve, so we'll still be earning inve investments on it. It's just something we won't be tempted to spend on something else knowing that it's coming up. So it's just a reserve. Councillor Barry. I wonder if you could explain, wh what do you mean by the reclamation of uh, Fowler Road? Oh, you wait till you get to this budget hearing and you will learn more about <laughs> reclamation compared to other forms of... Uh, Somebody claim it and we have to claim it back. Oh, it's... <laughs> Why don't we let Bob do that? Yeah, but I, I want to go get a cup of coffee. So before we have Bob come up here uh, to, to answer that, let me just, if I, if I might, uh, Councillor, is just indicate that, the t you know, some may ask, you know, why are we doing this now or whatever. The town has had a tradition of using available moments when the financial picture looks good of taking care of some of these big ticket items. Yeah. I think the most unique one was when we had to do $500,000 <coughs> worth of work to close the refuse disposal area and to fix that whole place up. Mm -hmm. And we did it without raising any taxes by reserving funds when we're able to do them by taking care of needs. So that's, that's assuming that that question is going to come up. That's why I'm recommending we do it at this point, as well as when you look at the projections. If you added another 200 and something thousand onto next year's budget, that really you know, would, would be a very difficult challenge. With that, through uh, the chairman, uh, Mr. Malley could answer the question about what a reclamation is and talk about the truck for a bit. And Bob, let's have the, let's have the short version. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, reclamation is the grinding of the road surface uh, where you oh. take the pavement and actually rototill it. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it, in, in simple terms, that's basically what it is. Like they did on Hannaford Cove Road just outside. Uh, no, what we did on Sproink Avenue a few years back, oh. what we did on Sawyer Road and Eastman Road this past year. So it's a basic rototilling of the pavement and then regrading and repaving. Okay. That was short enough. 
Um, as far as the trucks concerned, uh, many of you heard, heard me talk about the need to maintain equipment replacement schedules over the years. And, you know, this year is no different. As you can see in the plan, there's a lot of equipment in there. Uh, and we're really facing the replacement of four major pieces of equipment in the next two years. We've got a lot of rolling stock over there. It needs to be taken care of. It needs to be replaced on a timely basis. And it's not, and it's not cheap. Uh, we have two full-size dump trucks that really could be replaced right now. We have a loader backhoe unit that was bought uh, in 1984. And we have a tractor unit that hauls our transfer trailer six times a week that was bought used. And that needs to be replaced. So we're trying to space this all out for you. And we're not trying to bunch things up. But unfortunately, they do come due. Uh, the truck that uh, is proposed to be replaced was affectionately known as Big Bertha over the years. It's a 1977 International that uh, was purchased uh, uh, for the sum of about $37,500. Uh, unfortunately, over the years since we've had it, which is about 21 years, we've put about $38,000 into it. So uh, that really tells the tale. There's a number of uh, mechanical deficiencies with it. Uh, the engine needs to be overhauled. The frame is, is literally splitting apart due to rust and corrosion. Uh, it's a double frame truck. They actually, the bolt heads are actually popping off because of corrosion between the two layers of the frame. So we're really concerned about uh, having it pass a vehicle inspection uh, license next year. We've got a, a sticker on it now. It's not a problem, but it's just, it's been used as one of our primary sanding and salting units over that time period. And it's been used primarily just in the winter time. Um, it is a four-wheel drive unit. We're not talking about replacing it with a four-wheel drive unit. We're replacing it, or would like to, with a tandem axle dump truck that has a much larger body capacity that we can use during spring and fall heavy item pickups, uh, use it to remove and haul snow, and it's much more economical to, uh, to carry materials. On the new truck, is there some way that uh, you could uh, either put plastic or some covering over the metal to prevent, because it's used for salt? What we'd like corrosion. to go to is a single frame truck which is not quite susceptible to the rusting and corrosion that a double frame truck is. There's kind of two schools of thought. The double frame truck is a much stronger truck. You pay a little bit more money, but a lot of the towns have gone to single frame trucks uh, without any problems. So that's what I would suggest doing. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what a wheeler tandem axle dump truck It's actually a dump truck with two rear axles on it. You probably see them rumbling through town. and. Um, but they are just a, a larger version of what we use. We use a single axle truck with uh, just a single axle and two rear duels in the back. But this is a tandem axle with two, tr two axles in the back of the unit. It's a little bit, it's a bigger truck. Councilor Reed. So, Bob, there's probably not a whole lot of trade in value, huh? Uh, we've checked on that. Unfortunately, trade in value is a very hard thing to budget for. Uh, they've told us that it could be anywhere between five and ten thousand dollars, but there's no guarantees. Um, could you tell me um, the plan is for us to set this aside tonight so that they could purchase it tomorrow before the winter? So they could begin a bid process. Well, yeah, mm. that's what I meant. No, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't come in. The I, bid process began tomorrow. When would it come in? I would say around April 1st. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So it really winter. wouldn't. Right. You have to use this one for the winter. Yes. Yeah. Without spending all that money to have the mechanical defects fixed? Right. Thank you. Councilor McKinnon. Question for the town manager. I think, did, I can't, these uh, budget hearings are running together now. Do, do, we, do you have a regular replacement schedule as the fire department, for mm -hmm. instance, on these vehicles? Yep. And maybe this question for the town manager. Why, why don't we have a regular reserve account as we do for the fire department so that we budget these over a period of years? The reason is, is it, as you, if you look at, for example, the draft capital improvement plan for next year, which does not include this and which does not include Fowler Road, what, what I tend to look at with public works instead of reserve funds specific for their equipment is to look at an amount that is generally that we apply to all of the departments so we look at all of the needs so that you know, not a single thing gets, gets uh, dedicated as in the fire department. So you know, everything in public works has to compete against That's everything else. And that's, that's the reason why we don't use reserve fund. So in yes, effect, there, there is a reserve fund, but not a reserve fund for particular items. And no, not specific for public works. The, the only place we've done that is with the fire department. Mm -hmm. When we recognized that we needed to be doing four, it was, it was so clear that if we had set aside forty to 50000 every year, we'd never have a 
would never have spikes with buying equipment. Unfortunately, with public works, what we've, what we've done is we've, we've extended out the, the replacement schedule because we're trying to catch up on other things, and we're, we're finding that it's beginning to cost us money. And we, you know, I'd like, I'd like to accelerate it, but at the same time, uh, you know, with everything else the town is facing, and with that 3.41 percent property tax increase this past year, they're, they're just with all the other priorities and needs, uh, you know, and there wasn't enough money at that point to, to know that we might be able to consider that at this time. Okay. Councilor Fritz. I wanted to go back to the Fowler Road. And, um, I mean, you mentioned in your, um, in our information packet that Main Dot would prefer to have a bigger project on Fowler Road and that you're not certain it would pass their muster as a smaller project. Why do they want something so large as $2.5 million? And, and if we use that money, then I suppose we would have to have it be a wider paved road and take away some of the character, is that? I think you answered the question. <laughs> well, I mean, they would insist that it be wider yeah, if, if, if we use that money? Yeah, if MDOT did not have to deal with local concerns, what you would end up there with is a road that's approximately double the current width oh, that has also the shoulders that we discussed so much with the bikeway issue in addition to that. You know, it would be a, a road that would drain absolutely perfectly, would be flat, would have some urban drainage components to it. Uh, and, you know, it would be a beautiful engineered road. It would not be aesthetically appropriate for follow road. So, I mean, it, I, I thought you were implying that if we set aside this money and kind of and push for the 600000 that we are more likely to get the kind of road we want, mm -hmm. or doesn't that happen? Exactly. More likely to get the 600000 Right. Yeah. Because there, there are some of the, the group that goes around and inspects the roads at MDOT. There's a group, six men in a van. Or is it eight men? All men. They call them the 12 angry men. Yeah, the 12 <laughs> angry men we call them. That, you know, that say that, you know, that we need to do that bigger thing. And they have put some pressure on some administrators at MDOT that we ought to do that. However, the commissioner of MDOT, John Melrose, when you listen to his speeches now, he's talking a totally different story. And what, what's being proposed here is much more in keeping with what the commissioner wants to do statewide. So I feel, you know, with a commitment from the town, uh, we'll have pretty clear sailing at the policy level of MDOT, although we, we may have some reluctance uh, in other aspects of the department. So the $600,000 comes from a different pot and it doesn't have the same requirements or it's just it's a different there are less requirements for reclamation? Yeah. What, what they were asking for was a full depth reconstruction installation of full drainage systems, full under drains, the, the fully engineered road. What we're looking for is the reclamation, which Bob explained what that is. It's a much less severe treatment, or, uh, or a much less intense treatment. Councilor Reed. Um, many of us sitting on the council remember a recent survey that was done, but uh, I'll remind the council that three years ago when we did a survey, and especially, uh, related to the Pedals and Pedestrian Committee that I served on, uh, there was a, a large percentage of the townspeople who wanted Fowler Road, and particularly many of the people that lived there. In fact, some of Fowler Road was so bad, Bob, that you went out immediately and yeah. did uh, emergency repairs. Oh, two repairs. years ago, we did some emergency repairs on it. Right, and we did make uh, a promise. I say we, I was on the council then to uh, members of the public that as soon as the funds were available, it would become a priority. So um, I think we are, in fact, keeping our promise uh, to look at that. And I also uh, remind uh, counselors who weren't part of the budget process a few years ago, um, we actually have fallen behind in some of the road improvements that we have, like we have with some of our capital expenses, to take care of the uh, emergency needs that are presented. So this is a perfect opportunity to plan, and uh, I certainly support both of these. Councilor Barry. Uh, is there a proposed widening of Fowler Road here or not? No. no. All right. I'm not saying that 
you know, we have had some folks on some streets who have gone and measured inch by inch. You know, it will be essentially the same width. It may be a little bit more uniform than it now is, but it will be essentially the same average width that it is now. Councilor McGinty. Just in response to Councilor Reed, my recollection was that we promised them by the year 2000 to get that job done. And certainly and if we got close. it done earlier, that would be even better. Well, my memory is that we explained that it would have to be tied in with state funds. Right. We were competing with PACs for money. We were on the calendar. We would do everything we could do to get the PACs money. We would uh, be certainly willing to put in our share. And I think what we're talking now is just trying to uh, uh, make sure this is another step in making sure we get the PACs money because obviously if we don't get the PACs money, the $150,000 alone isn't going to go very far. Mm. I agree. Further comment? Further discussion? Is there a motion concerning the Fowler Road Reclamation in to set aside the $150,000 for the Fowler Road Reclamation and $105,000 for the purchase of a dump truck and related gear? So moved. Councillor Fritz. Second. Second by Councillor Berry. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's seven to nothing. Was it 105 or 103? 105. 103. 103. Uh, I see one paper is 103 and one's 105. Mr. McGovern always adds 2,000, I think, is the problem. So we will make it 103, Bob, because you said 103. Uh, all right. Action, uh, item number 74. Action upon proposed creation of a community center study committee. Mr. McGovern. Yes, uh, I didn't add 2,000 to this one. Uh, oh, good. Seriously, this, the, the council had, I think, a, an excellent discussion at a workshop meeting uh, on this committee, and it would, what it would do is uh, <coughs> look at uh, all, really, any land in town is what it came around to, that, that might be appropriate to, to have in a center that would serve the youth and uh, the senior members of our community as well as, as well as, excuse me, as well as others. It would be nine members, including uh, some from representative groups, as well as uh, three citizens chosen uh, by the, using the appointments committee's process uh, with the town council. Uh, part of this would be looking at not only facilities, but also what types of programs and activities one would contemplate having in a center if there's one available. I think that's the, probably the most important part of this process, is to is the assess the need and the uh, the types of things so that you, you design whatever you design or whatever you look at for, for facilities, uh, you, you base it on the need of the program rather than on the building that you already have. You have everyone has in their packet uh, the guidelines for the Community Center Study Committee. I'd like note that uh, at the workshop it was determined that there would be a cap on any services uh, <coughs> that could be retained by this committee in a fiscal amount of $5,000. Nothing would be authorized up to, of any of that $5,000 unless mm -hmm. specifically authorized by the town manager, but that gave the town manager a, a limit to his discretion as far as this committee goes. Is there a motion to uh, uh, establish uh, this community center study committee? Councillor Berry. So moved. Councillor Reed, second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion on the uh, uh, the language or anything else concerning the establishment of the community center study committee? Councillor Reed. Uh, in case um, a councillor may vote against this for fear they might be asked to volunteer, I just would like uh, my interest uh, known to be that member who could continue to serve at the option of the committee, even though my service to the count, town council has ended. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. Oh, Councilor. I'm, I'm going to support this, but I, I just hope that the committee um, doesn't, doesn't focus too much on the idea of a structure that is a community center. I hope that m most of the focus is on how can we use our current facilities to, to meet some of the recreational needs of the seniors and the teens rather than 
because um, I, th I think we can use our buildings a little bit better. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Opposed? Passes seven to nothing. The chair will appoint uh, uh, Councillor Reed and Councillor Watson to serve on this committee on behalf of the town council. We are now at uh, item 75, consideration of a request from the fire chief of a draft policy relating to the water complaint responses. Chief, yes, come on up. No. I don't want Mr. McGovern to speak for you. Thank you. <laughs> Chief, you should understand that we obviously all have your memoranda yes. in our packet, but uh, I know you uh, keep if it you could me. explain to the public what we're talking about, and okay. then we could ask you some questions. Um, basically, uh, two years ago, we had the October floods, and, and we handled over 200 calls uh, during that period of time for flooded cellars, and it cost us an appreciable amount of money, but the federal government reimbursed us for a lot of our costs, so that we put aside and we figured that that was the 100-year storm and none of us were going to have to worry about it again, but lo and behold, we get struck again this fall. And a lot of the um, people, as you know, they're, they're paid on call, but they're still uh, volunteers, and it takes a lot of that time, and we spend 24 hours on the last storm pumping cellars, and a lot of the people got uh, a lot of my firefighters got a little uptight about spending that much time and especially in a lot of situations where um, this may have been a second or a third repeat situation and they felt like um, that the public in some cases weren't accepting their responsibility to take care of the problems that they knew existed within their own homes and it was that in effect taking us away from other locations in the community that people could have used to help just as well. Uh, you can appreciate when we get a bunch of storm, a storm like this that we get a lot of calls at one time and we kind of stack them and we take them as quickly as we can but we can't, we can't service them all at that time so the thought was and I, and I met with the uh, senior officers of the department and we drafted this policy uh, they were all in concurrence with this policy uh, the policy was brought before both engine one and engine two company and explained to them and I think uh, probably for the most part that everybody buys into it uh, we have a lot of we have a number of aggressive new firefighters in the department and you could run them 24 hours a day seven days a week and they probably wouldn't stop but um, the older members of the department kind of like to break it off after 24 hours so the suggested policy as 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 you see it in front of you uh, we will answer any and all calls as we've stated uh, we intended to do that um, when we get to the location um, if it's a uh, situation that the dispatcher will dispatch just like he normally does and he'll look up on his water call list and while they're responding he'll tell them that they've been there before that the people have been notified in writing um, and at that point the fire department will respond and they'll make the home as safe as they can if that means disconnecting power if it's the appropriate thing to do or uh, shutting down the furnace, uh, whatever those kinds of things are we should do. We will do that, um, but we will not pump. We will move on to the next location that hasn't been pumped and pump them. <coughs> and knowing full well that um, this community is very public service orientated, um, we felt that um, if we stop doing this as we've done it in the past, that the town council would uh, be made aware of it by telephone calls, and we felt that you should be on the front line with us and if it's something that uh, you agree with what we're suggesting, that's fine. And if you don't, you're the boss and we'll do what you say. Now, Chief, if I understand things correctly, I mean, you have the ability to set your own policies, but at this point in time, you're simply asking the town council uh, to concur in this policy? That's correct. All right. So where it's, I understand. All right. So questions for the chief? Yeah. Councilor Watson. Chief Magula, I understand the policy, and in, in many respects, I agree with that if, if when notified once the people do not install the proper pumps 
that they need to pump the water out, that there's a necessity to maybe say, you know, you didn't do what you were supposed to do, so, you know, second time around, we're not going to do it for you. However, I, I would like to see a little flexibility here because sometimes there are extenuating circumstances where even when they have done everything, you know, people have told them to do, they've bought a pump, somehow it still hasn't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. I would like us not to have quite so hard and fa fast a policy and one that was more flexible um, based on the, the circumstances. The, you know, there will be people who no matter what you tell them to do mm -hmm. will not do it. But there are also many more people who, who will conscientiously try to fix the problem and there may be times when it, it still isn't sufficient. And I would really like to see us be a little bit more willing to to do that and I understand that you probably would even though you had this policy but I would like to somehow I would feel more comfortable with it having a, a, you know a clause that for extenuating circumstances that we would not not respond the company officer on the scene is always going to take into consideration uh, the circumstances surrounding what the call is and they've got the they've got every right in the world to make those judgments we set up these kinds of things, suggested operating guidelines, and they are just what they said they are, that suggested operating guidelines. This is kind of the way we expect it, but if something happens that's different than that, that officer's got to be able to think on his feet and say, we've got a little bit of different circumstance here, we've got to deviate from the policy, and as long as they can justify what it is that they've done, they won't have a problem with it. Councilor McGinty. Um, I pretty much agree with what the Councilor Watson said. I think in the abstract, this policy sounds good, but that night at 3 o'clock in the morning when we know we have a pup pump on a truck that we could use to help these people out, and the officer is going to have to say, sorry, you've been warned once, we're leaving, you know, there's going to be some ill will, and, you know, I, I, you know, and I recognize you have some of your officers here, but well, it's going to be tough to have to face, face down these citizens and say, sorry, we can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I understand, like I said, in the abstract, I understand the policy. I think people um, should take care of their property. It's their responsibility to take care of their basements or whatever. Um, but it's going to be difficult. Chief, but if it was the situation where it was 3 o'clock in the morning and there was public safety involved and, and there was, I mean, your problem, it seems to me, is more you have 25 basements lined up filled there's plenty of time to pump all the basements and people to make alternative arrangements but that true emergency situation at three in the morning I can't imagine getting out to the scene at three in the morning and having the ability to pump it you're there you don't have three other or ten other calls waiting well I mean somebody might use their discretion and do that right I I, I would certainly hope that that would be the case Again, what we're looking at here is when we've got multiple situations and a person, I mean, if this, if, if somebody, if somebody's water pipes in their home burst, yeah. we're not talking about that. That's something above and beyond what we're talking about here. Um, if a water main in front of the house, uh, the sewer in front of the house backed up uh, and there was some sort of extending circumstances, we're, we're going to take that into consideration. What we're trying to draft here is something when we have 200 calls facing us and we're going back and these people now are expecting us. We had people the last time call us with like about an inch of water on their floor because we went before and they wanted us down there to water vac. I mean, we had some real circumstances where you would be amazed, you know, this is my tax dollars and I expect you to do it and we've got people with six feet of water in this cellar. Mm -hmm. This gives us the ability to say, You've been forewarned. You know you have a problem. I was at one house that was our third time at that lady's house. And she said, well, I'm selling the house. And I said, well, that's not the town's problem that you're selling the house. You know, you still should have put in a sump pump. And hers was a minor problem. She could have put in a sump pump, taken care of a problem. But no, she gets on the phone and calls us, and we've got a lot of other people waiting for it. This, this is what this is intended to be for. It's really intended to be for the person that's the chronic, that's not going to take care of the problem themselves, and they put everybody else in town at jeopardy at that. Um, these officers all know that they've got certain discretions. I mean, and, and they know 
as long as they can justify what it is that they're, that they're doing, that they won't have a problem. But we do need to have some sort of a policy because it is a big problem. I mean, you saw in here, it cost us $4,000 for that 24 hours. I mean, that's, that's budgetary money. And I mean, and a bulk of these could have been handled by people themselves. I mean, we went back to many, many places that knew they had a problem and did absolutely nothing to help themselves between the last time and this time. Those are the people that we're interested in. Councilor? Councilor Mary. Uh, I think some of the uh, problem of the water is not necessarily the homeowner, but uh, the town. Uh, uh, drainage systems on the street where you have uh, an overflow of, uh, of a storm drain and it goes into somebody's yard and then into the cellar, uh, then what can the citizen do about that? Uh, I think that the fire department is... Now, part of that $4,000 was for the three feet of water in my cellar, and I was very grateful for it. And I think they did a wonderful job when they came down, and it wasn't, they were up all night, mm -hmm. uh, the October uh, uh, flood a couple of years ago. But, uh, and I did install a sump pump, uh, which uh, <laughs> seems to work pretty well. But I can understand your frustration at having gone back several times. Mm -hmm. But I think if the, the, the problem is bigger than just the fire department, I, I think you have uh, some public works problems here that may arise from a, a development creating situation where water would uh, flow into a street needing a storm drain and so forth. That can have an effect on an individual uh, property that might be a repeat situation, a chronic situation that uh, would be difficult to deal with under the policy. Uh, I, I understand it's difficult to write a statute or an ordinance that covers all situations, so you have to re uh, leave some room for discretion. But I think those uh, outside the personal property uh, uh, boundaries, that type of problem should be considered as well uh, as far as uh, the cause of the, the if you have one inch in the cellar, I don't see that that's a problem. It won't probably go over the furnace and you don't have to unplug it. So, um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can't talk because I'm cough. So, but but that, that's what I was concerned about. <coughs> Street drainage problems right. are causing right. housing. Right. But I, hopefully, hopefully, Chief, I would assume that if it's disseminated that the fire department has this policy, it would then behoove individuals who have possible problems with street drainage to make more of an effort to get to the town to report those problems uh, so that we would be in a position where, especially once they received the letter the first time, if you're somebody and you get a letter saying, oh, this is a problem we pumped, I think we're going to hear from that individual and the problem's going to be here where it should be to do something about that drainage problem. And if we can't, then it's very easy to sit there and administratively mark on that letter it's a town problem. If I, if I might add to that, I, I think we've, we've done quite a good job over the last uh, number of years, I, I don't want to pinpoint it specifically, uh, trying to address individual drain issues. There are still a number of homes that were built in areas that should never have been built on. We did not have proper wetland regulation for many, many years. And there were also many homes that were built in swales. There is no heavenly way possible uh, by, the, by the laws of gravity and the, the, the laws of nature that some of that water isn't going to find its way to the low point. Uh, you know, I, I think you know, we, we do do a good job addressing drainage, and, and people aren't hesitant to call. At, at any time is, is evidenced by the number of calls the fire department gets and the follow-up calls we get. I, I think it's important, you know, I, I have, I see Deputy Chief uh, Peter Gleason here, I know Deputy Chief Murray, Captain Michael Jordan who's here, as well as Captain Bob Williams, uh, all always put the citizen first. If you know any of those folks, they do, they make good judgment, I assume their successes will, as well as the chief. Uh, the issue is, is, is it'd be really nice to have a policy that we do have people that we know who are obviously endangering themselves is what this is really about because they're not addressing their problem and at some point we're going to have to go be somewhere else with, that they could have easily handled and that's what this really is. It's a message to citizens that you should be taking care of your own problems. You know, I'm reminded of the phone calls we get when people say that the, the catch basin is going to flood over, you know, during a winter you know, storm, uh, you know, when it suddenly turns to rain. We don't have enough personnel to immediately get out there and clear every catch basin. For the time that many people spend complaining, they could have gone out there a minute 
and you know there's an absolute disaster going to happen. It's 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 things like that that you know it's nice people need to address some of their own issues on their own if they're to really protect their properties. We we can do as much as we can, but relying in large part on volunteers and a limited number of people. So you know I you know if you adopt this policy, you know I I state publicly that it uh, will not be heavy-handed administration of it, and it's it simply you know, in, in the way of helping people to understand that it's in their best interest to uh, address their own problems. Is there a motion? May I make a comment first? Sure. I'm probably on the list of do not respond. <laughs> <laughs> but That's right, isn't it? The good news, the good news is uh, <laughs> Mr. Jordan was there the last time, as was the police chief. And the even better news is in the last storm, because Public Works had been there, uh, to put in a new storm drain, I didn't flood. Um, so what I would just ask is some, uh, just a little bit of a step back a minute, uh, because there are two things. One, the $4,000 we were reimbursed from FEMA was because it was a, a true 100 year storm. Unfortunately for Cape Elizabeth and many other people, um, but our residents as well as our volunteers, um, the second hundred year storm came only two years later. And I think that this might be perceived as reactionary. And what I would rather ask the council to consider is instead of a policy that the town council sets, it's a little bit like the mailboxes. What do we do when the, the plow hits the mailbox? Well, we had a 40 minute discussion on what to do with a $10 mailbox. And, you know, it, I really think that it would be in our best um, uh, interest to allow discretion to the town manager and the department head for an administrative guideline about noting to people who have problems uh, of repetitive use or repetitive requests that that be dealt individually and not with a broad brush policy. So that's my two cents. If I understand this correctly, we're not setting a town council policy. We are simply, the fire chief has brought to our attention a policy that he is going to implement, and be, but before he and uh, the department implement it, they wanted the town council to at least express concurrence <clears throat> with this policy. Now, I don't think that makes it Quite frankly, I, uh, I applaud you, Chief, because I think this is the way on something like this to do it, rather than us to hear about it through the back door, which very well could have happened. Now, I don't think for us concurring with this policy ties the Chief or the Department. They can modify it any time they want. I mean, this isn't our policy. It's theirs. They're just simply putting us on notice and, and seeing if we go along with this, because uh, they know how things would work if we didn't hear about it. We'd get the calls, and they would get the calls. So I mean, I don't see it quite as clear cut. I see what they're doing is sort of what you want. But the way it works, in my view, unless you have some clearly stated policy, then people have a sense of entitlement, and you can't say no to anyone. And that's pretty tough. And I think they have to have at least the ability, whether it's through us or uh, concurring or through doing it on their own, you have to have the ability to say no. Mr. Chairman, ba based on what you've said, if, if the council, you know, if in keeping with the drift I'm getting from the council on this, uh, wh why don't we do this? Uh, the council would, would table it, and it would not come back to you. In, in the meantime, I'll review it with the chief. We'll, we'll put, make sure there's language in it that's the spirit of what you said. And then as, as we do with many things, that we, we don't call it a, I don't, we don't call it a policy because we feel the council can only do, only the council can do a policy. But we'll, we'll call it administrative, we'll call it, you know, department practice or departmental policy or something. And uh, I'll stamp approved on it. And we, we just, we would like to have something to be able to give to citizens. It will not have the, the, the uh, imprimatur of the town council specifically, but at least we will have had this discussion and you'll be knowledgeable on the issue and we'll very much do it in keeping with what you've said. Okay. I think it'd be, 
very helpful to have some of this policy in, in place. I mean, the letters to the citizens telling them they ought to be getting a sump pump, taking care of their problems. It's, it's the, the policy on the second time, you know, they'll only take care of the power and not pump and, and you know, that rigid sense that we, is bothering me. We, we, I hear that message and we can work the language so that you know, the, the bottom line is that we're encouraging citizens to, to ensure that, that their safety and welfare is looked after. Mr. Themselves. Chairman, I move that this item be tabled. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded and this item be tabled. All in favor? Seven to nothing. Items tabled. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, I don't know. Has most of the council met uh, Deputy Chief Peter Gleason? Peter is the quieter of the two <coughs> deputies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> every, everyone knows Al P. Murray, the other deputy who's not with us this evening. And over on the other side of Mr. Malley's Captain Mike Jordan, who I think you all know who's the captain of Engine 2. I appreciate work both of them being here this evening. Thanks for coming, Chief. And thank you for presenting this to us. Okay. Item 76, action upon proposed amendments to the Spurwink Church Rules and Regulations. Is Mr. McGovern? Yeah, I wrote an extensive memo on this. Uh, it raises rates some in the whole concept of trying to make the church self-supporting. I noticed there's a typo in the the provision of the use, and I will correct that. It uh, relates to uh, I saw it earlier. I don't see it. The capacity of the church is one is 150, not if. So, uh, in in the interest of time and the season, I won't go over this unless there's questions. Basically, it just ups the fee structure. The resident fee from 100 to 175, the non-resident <coughs> fee from 200 to 275, church openings from 10 to $25, and so the public knows we spent $15,000 on the roof, and this is just an, an attempt to make uh, expenditures and revenues match a little better. But Mr. Councillor Barry. Question, is, is this enough to cover the uh, expense of maintenance, including the roof? It, it is with, with over the longer term with one exception that I'm very nervous about, and that's that the weather vane on the roof of the church was last done by Ralph Gould, Gold Leaf 25 years ago. And we're trying to find an estimate on that. I think it might be a little bit startling. If, if you look at it, even from the ground, you can see it really needs to be re gold leafed. And what I'm really hoping is that, you know, through donations or some way we could we could have that project done at some point because uh, but aside from that we do think these fees will enable the church to be self-supporting for at least five or six years it, it's tough to make any property <coughs> that has historical relevance that so many people in the Cape get pleasure out of simply viewing it mm. but don't use it mm. to make it totally self-sustaining by those individuals who use the inside of it and I think that the weather vane is the prime example there. Who gets the, the pleasure from looking at the weather vane? Well, we all do if it's, if it's nice. You know? And so it's hard to make it totally self-sustaining, but I think this is a good step forward. Councilor Reed. I have a brief comment, and that is that when we look in the paper on Tuesdays and Fridays, we can often see how many people who are married in Cape Elizabeth are divorced. Um, maybe if we raise the fees, uh, we will be uh, <laughs> contributing to decreasing those divorce figures. But seriously, my comment is, have we <laughs> taken into account? It's getting late now. I know. Yeah. Have we taken into account how many people may choose an alternative site um, with these increase in fees? Yes, we we discussed that at our meeting in terms of the demand for the church. Janet Hannigan, who's our church greeter, just does a does a great great job, and she came to. I think we had a really good meeting <laughs> with a whole lot of church issues, and yeah, you know, we gave that quite a bit of consideration. We feel that this will not diminish revenue. I, I do hope that it is looked at again next year. It'll be after me, but yeah. just to make sure that we haven't priced ourselves out of the uh, market. Councilor McGinty. Yeah. I've never been divorced, but um, <laughs> to, uh, I don't think $250 doesn't sound like an awful lot of money to me, quite honestly, for you know, your wedding day or whatever. I don't it. know. It doesn't sound that way to me either. No, so. I, I just would hate to see us try to yeah, I, price accordingly but you know reduce the overall revenue I understand what you're saying <coughs> is there a motion I'll, I'll move um, the provisions for use of the Sperling Church a second um, I had a question um, just should 
the rental fees should that be for for weddings for residents and non-residents or is it just any use we we're changing it uh, so it's those delineated amounts that is for for any use it's not a christening and a memorial service once in a while they want it for some other use mm -hmm. But it is, while it's understood that's predominantly for weddings, that could be for another use as well. So it could be a concert sponsored by a, a resident. Yeah. But again, it's one of those things. You, we don't specifically put into the policy all those types of things mm -hmm. because our primary interest is the, the preservation of the church. And some people might want to propose something that might not be in keeping with the character and the, the uh, sanctity of the site. And so Watson. One question about the use of the church. Do we charge the school groups to go in there for their concerts? Do they pay the same fee as an individual? What school groups? Um, I thought I read where there was a middle school concert or something. Maybe I got that confused with something else. I thought there was, there was a high, high school, school concerts. concerts. Do we charge the high school? We, we don't charge like the Arts Commission right. the use. We don't, charge, <coughs> we don't charge the town itself, of which right. the school department is part of the <coughs> I didn't think so. Just wanted to. Councilor Berry. A month ago, I attended a wedding that cost approximately five times as much as my first house. And I think that <laughs> Councilor uh, 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 Reed's uh, comments are, uh, uh, I think her fears are unfounded. And so I move the question. <laughs> All in favor? Opposed? What were you? I can get the energy to lift up. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> Councilor Carson is sick. <clears throat> you you know you're sick when you can't get that right arm up. Really? <laughs> and I can't. I'm going to take either. that take that right arm not going up for the nay as a yay and have it <laughs> unanimous at seven to nothing. Uh, item 77, action upon recommendation to set a public hearing on the proposed boundary <clears throat> perambulation between South Portland and Cape Elizabeth. Yes. Two, two issues on this, Mr. Chairman. One is that there's a proposed draft motion that was prepared from the town attorney. And secondly, some of you may have read uh, articles in newspapers about the fact that this came in above the estimate that South Portland had for it. Uh, we had budgeted $21,500 for this project. South Portland had budgeted less, assuming that they were going to be using in-house legal work and assuming that the contract was going to come in exactly as it was. It was my anticipation that we were going to be paying OST approximately 18500 and that we were going to have an, an additional $3,000 in legal expenses. What ended up happening was that OST did most of the title research uh, that I anticipated having to be done by Tom Leahy's office. So anyway, South Portland and the town of Cape Elizabeth both got letters about oh, a month, month, month and a half ago saying that the cost had come in because of the fact that the 1895 perambulation didn't have the right names and a couple of other issues, that the cost came in higher than anticipated. Uh, South Portland had been administering this contract. It was actually with South Portland, and we were just paying them their share. So I told Jeff Jordan, the city manager of South Portland, since they were the contract administrator, that it was important that South Portland take the lead on this issue uh, as, as, as the administrator of the contract. Uh, that city council had a workshop on it at which they discussed at length uh, this issue. It was their old council. Kevin Glynn, among others, was strongly in favor of, of paying them the full amount they were asking for. Uh, so they discussed the workshop. They subsequently re reviewed it again. I think, I think it was with the new council, though I'm not sure, but they actually voted at a, at a city council meeting. And what they agreed to do as, as a city was that they would pay half of the added amount that was asked for or actually 50% of it is their 50% share. That is $3,013.75 that their, their council approved. Uh, with that, that still keeps us uh, 70, excuse me, $86.25 below the amount that had been appropriated by the town council <coughs> for this. Uh, we are going to have uh, probably about $500 on legal fees and we'll charge that to the regular legal account. So that is the status of that vis-a-vis -vis Cape Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Fine budgeting. <laughs> um, we then need to act upon 
What are we actually what are you? setting a public hearing on? Hmm? Setting a public hearing. I'll move that we set a public hearing for January 11th, 1999 at 7.30 p.m. at the Town Hall. A second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we have a town here, a public hearing set for Monday, January 11th, 1999 at 7.30 p.m. at Town Hall. All in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous, seven and nothing. Um, citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda? Hearing none. No citizens. Is there a motion, uh, Mr. McGovern? I just wanted to mention that the town hall will be closing at noon on December 24th and will be closing at 4 p.m. on December 31st. That same hours apply to the library uh, and to other non-essential non services, including the refuse disposal area. So the refuse disposal area will be closing at noon on December 24th and at 4 p.m. on um, December 31st. Is there a motion to enter executive session on issues relating to collective bargaining with local 340 of the Teamsters Union representing public works employees and thereafter possible action relative to negotiations? I'll make the motion. Councilor Berry is second. second. Second by Councilor Fritz. All in favor? Uh, it is not anticipated. We might come back into session, but uh, it is not anticipated we will be back on the air tonight. Um, Folks.